Well, good morning and welcome to today's webinar uh, brought to you by FS Club. We have with us today Brett Scott, who's the author of a fascinating book called Cloud Money. And Brett's making some interesting arguments about cash. So the title today is Cash is Not the Horse Cart of Payments, It's the Public Bicycle. And you'll know me, I'm Michael Minelli, I'm one of the directors of Zien, and we're able to bring you these webinars only uh, because of the tolerance generosity and wide-ranging interests of our many sponsors, uh, whom we thank most sincerely for allowing us to range widely and freely across a, a whole variety of topics. Uh, but underpinning everything to do with economics and finance is the concept of money. And Brett's going to be making some important points today about why it is that we are neglecting cash in a world where we're talking about central bank, digital currencies, cashless societies. Cash still retains its importance even in some of those societies that have gone virtually cashless, and he'll be explaining that. Now, my job is to get out of the way as quickly as possible, but we'll be following a, a format known to many regular listeners, and that's that uh, Brett will be speaking for 20 minutes, and then we have about 20 minutes for a Q&A, and I'm counting on you uh, for some very, very uh, probing questions in this subject area. Um, one of the things that uh, I always have to point out is that you need to participate in the Q&A by typing into the Q&A area. I'm here with you. Uh, I'm not on Twitter or Signal or any of the other various means that we can communicate with each other. Uh, and I'll feed your questions into a conversation with Brett. Brett will be getting all of the questions with your email attached. So if you want to point him to something or you like to contact him directly, just fire it in there and we'll make sure that he gets it. And his email is at the end of his presentation as well. Uh, what I'd finally like to say is that the slides uh, will be posted uh, in about two working days. Um, so you'll have them just in time for the weekend, I hope. Uh, and you can uh, view this uh, presentation again and have a bit of fun uh, listening to the recording over Christmas. I'm sure this is what you're all about to do. But seriously, with no further ado, uh, Brett, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much. Um, let's switch to my slides. Well, it's great to be here. Um, I think the last Finance Club uh, event I went to was actually in person quite a few years ago. Um, so it's been it's been a little while, but it's uh, great to be on the online version of it. Um, and yeah, today I'm going to be uh, talking about at least a part of my my new book, which is called um, Cloud Money, Cash Cards, Crypto, and the War for Our Wallets. And um, I'm actually jumping forward to my slides here. Sorry, I'm still getting used to the technology. Um, there we go. Um, so yeah, this book came out in May and actually it covers more than cashless society as a concept. It's looking essentially at the fusion of big finance and big tech, um, of which the, uh, let's say the ideological attack on the cash system is one part of, of that process. So I'm, I'm looking at a kind of a sort of structural level, um, at a structural level, I, I was getting very frustrated in the past around the fact that the way that this move away from cash was presented was always presented as if it was this bottom up, natural sort of organic upwelling from ordinary people. Right. The typical way newspapers were presenting cashless society was just to say ordinary people are just naturally and inevitably moving towards these digital payment systems. And the big agenda in, in cloud money is ready to show that actually there's much larger structural processes going on which means that actually the will of the ordinary person has comparatively a small amount to do with what's, what's, what's going on. Uh, but the book is also looking at how the cryptocurrency movements relate to that broader process of big tech and big finance uh, fusing together. Um, the book is in about seven or eight languages now. Uh, so it's coming out and it's been come out in many places And this uh, slide here shows the paperback version, which will be coming out next year. Um, but yeah, maybe the first thing I'll say is the we live right now in the world um, under a let's still call it a prevailing ideology, a prevailing sort of thought system. No matter where I go in the world, uh, whether it's South Africa, which is my home country, or whether it's you know the U.S. or Italy, anywhere you go, there is a prevailing idea, especially among political elites, that what progress means in society is ever more automation, 
ever more digitization, which are kind of seen as one and the same thing, um, ever more scale, speed, and interconnection. All right. This is a prevailing idea that progress basically means you have all of those things happening. Essentially, an acceleration an acceleration and a kind of expansion of the global economic system, right? And this, I use this image here because this kind of like conveys the sort of the standard visual imagery of that kind of hype, all right? This idea that there's an unstoppable and natural move towards this ever more of this complexity and automation, right? Now, I believe that this is actually a particular ideology rather than a reality. I think many, many human beings actually experience themselves as being you know, biological creatures on a on a planet, right? We like doing things like you know, sitting by a fire and drinking you know, uh, you know, beer and stuff. It's like the idea that we were are naturally drawn towards this sort of vision of becoming kind of um, ethereal, sort of virtual reality beings is actually very. I mean, it's a, maybe some people have this this idea partially, maybe that some people are drawn to it, but I feel like comparatively few people are actually truly drawn to that vision. But one, um, in terms of it, this, this idea as an ideology, it's very, very appealing to very large corporates, right? Because a lot of these trajectories are essentially how you scale and optimize corporate profit, optim profit accumulation, right? So I, my, one of my core beliefs is that this, this, we have this, this idea precisely because we have a particular structured economic system and um, this is how it seep, seeped into society. Now, within the realm of money, though, this same type of belief system um, started to seep in. Many people believe there's a kind of a natural transition from forms of physical money to digital money, right? And many people have internalized the idea that actually what digital money is, is a kind of an upgrade. It's sort of an upgrade from, from cash. There are many other reasons why people have this belief. I mean, I've just foregrounded the kind of prevailing sort of um, tech ideology. There are actually various other reasons why people have this belief, including um, a, a particular way that the economics discipline speaks about money. Um, and there's various other sort of like sort of misunderstandings around money, which mean people often fixate upon the token form of money. So they often fixate upon the changes to the surface appearance of a monetary system. All right. And so many people have this idea in their heads that there's a sort of this natural transition occurring. Um, from cash up to uh, digital money. And they often believe it's only one type of money in society, right? So they think that digital money is a little bit like, you know, um, if you're comparing a, an acoustic guitar to an electric guitar. They're like, well, they're basically the same thing, but one's just like slightly more digital than the other or slightly more electric or something, right? They don't make a distinction between these types of money at a fundamental level, all right? Um, and so the standard story we then get which prevails through actually, regardless of if you're pro cash or anti cash, loads and loads of people have this basic background idea that cash is basically like the horse cart of payments, all right, waiting for its inevitable demise. Okay. And there's often, even when you find, say, concerned politicians when they're speaking about this issue, they'll often actually use this overarching framing. They'll say things like, we have to give time for the elderly people to transition. All right. They basically agree that there's a natural evolution that will occur to digital money. And then they say, let's give more time for people to sort of help them to like, you know, while they, there, are people, there are still people who use cash. There's lots of this language which implies that there's this natural change that will eventually have to happen, but maybe we should slow it down. Okay. This is the sort of the standard kind of political line. And with this political line or the sort of this, this framing comes these three bodies of critique on cash. One of which is just that it's old fashioned somehow, it's like out of date. Another one, which is that, that it's inefficient, all right, inconvenient. This is the sort of another very big body of critique. And then there's a third body of critique, which is that it's dangerous in some level, right? It's all about crime and tax evasion and it's dirty and all this kind of stuff, right? So this is the standard anti-cash ideology that's very, very popular. And so the, the imagery that's generated in our heads is very much this idea of a kind of an old form that inevitably must give way to some kind of new form and that you cannot stop this process, all right? And this is what's actually going through many, many people's heads um, so, for example, when I turn up on, let's say, the BBC, inevitably, the presenter will have this idea in their head and they'll ask me things. They'll say things like, well, you know, isn't it just inevitable? Surely it's just so much more convenient that all the standard stuff just gets pumped out. 
right? Um, that's very, very, very deeply entrenched um, belief system. Um, and another thing that goes along with this belief system is this idea that we as ordinary people are the ones that are driving this, okay? So this image here is how I often will think about economies. I often imagine economies as giant sort of interconnected um, webs with bigger and smaller players all tied together into a huge interdependent mesh. And then some of the sort of typical imagination, which is often perpetuated by standard economics, imagines that the, pay, the power or the agency lies with the small little players, the so-called consumer. So you'll often find these newspaper headlines which say things like, consumers are turning towards digital payments, consumers demand X, Y, and Z, as if all the agency in the network resided with the small uncoordinated players, rather than the big oligopoly players who have a lot more um, to gain, in a sense, collectively, than society as a whole does for these, these types of changes, all right? Um, so what I often seek to do is to break down the standard narrative of this, there being this upgrade occurring and that we are the ones doing the upgrade. So I have two basic metaphors that I use to, to break this, um, and I'll try to get through these in 10 minutes. The first metaphor basically is to break the idea that we have a single type of money in society, all right? And this is, I do this by using this uh, casino chip metaphor to show people that actually the cash system is a separate system with a different set of issues to the digital systems that we have, all right? Um, so I ask a person to imagine themselves entering a casino um, and handing over cash for chips, all right? Those chips are a secondary form of money that is privately issued and you can use it within the confines of the casino. And actually money in your bank account is not that different to this in many ways. Actually, when you hand over cash to a bank, they're not storing cash for you, they're issuing you digital chips, okay? So if you've got a Barclays bank account, you've got Barclays issued digital casino chips as it were, all right? Um, we'll, I won't go into all the depths of this. Of course, banks have the ability to issue far more of these chips than they actually have in state money reserves, which is what's sometimes called fractional reserve banking or credit creation of money. But basically, what the so-called cashless society is essentially when you move to the system of privately issued digital bank chips, and increasingly these third uh, layer promises on top of that as well by players like PayPal, all right? But the, the predominant cashless society debate is really about do you want to maintain this balance of power between state-issued money and bank-issued money, all right? Because the cashless society as it currently stands is basically moving towards total domination by bank-issued digital casino chips. I, I sometimes draw these pictures of this in my newsletter, which is called Altered States of Monetary Consciousness. Um, uh, there's a, I'll put a link at the end, but this is a bit of a strange picture, but I, I try to show people, you know, you can imagine the banking sector has been a kind of like an oligopoly um, hovering over society in a sense. And when you're doing digital transactions, you're essentially sending messages to their data centers and asking, to, asking permission essentially to make a transaction of these digital chips to somebody else. All right. And of course, there's a huge industry built up around this. And of course, that industry has a massive interest in trying to shift people to this second tier form of money, all right? And so I often think this phrase cashless society is a terrible, terrible euphemism, all right? So it's like calling whiskey beerless alcohol or ACDC a folk musicless band. We should just call them what they actually are. The cashless society is essentially a society where big tech and big finance dominates every single economic interaction without which you can't survive. If you're in London right now, you'll probably already be noticing this. You basically can't survive unless you ask Visa and MasterCard for permission, all right? Uh, that's basically how, what the difference in the quality of the society is. And you really start to feel that when the option is removed, all right? Um, and so the big, um, one of the big points I'm trying to make is just to draw people to the fact that actually many of these big players have been pushing, have been pushing against the cash system from the top down for many decades. And there's a lot of evidence of this all over the place. I don't have time to go through all the examples right now, but there's a huge part of the story has actually been the top down pushes against the cash system, which in turn do induce changes in the culture such that people start to imagine that they're the ones they're like, well, of course I've turned away. I chose to not use cash, da, 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 you know? So in this sort of self-imagination, people often perceive themselves to be the ones that have made the change. When in reality, there's been all these structural changes occurring over time that make it ever more likely that you will start to do that. This includes things like the bank branch network being shut down. I mean, HSBC just announced a 
a big load of, of bank um, um, branch shutdowns. Of course, if you shut down the branch network, none of the shop owners can deposit cash, which means, of course, they're going to then go cashless. All right. HSBC and these players are basically in a position because they control access to cash. They have the ability to essentially engineer forms of cashlessness, right? So they have they control access to their competitor, as it were, all right, um, which is a big, big issue. Uh, so they can do this this kind of stuff. But it's not only these players. I mean, this is a, this is an example in the U.S. Uh, Visa entering into deals with the NFL to basically force people to go cashless, all right? So the NF Visa entered this deal in 2019, um, and the NFL, of course, is an incredibly powerful uh culturally very very powerful in the u.s the super bowls those the american football millions of people watching this kind of stuff right and these players like visa will target these um big big events and say um and, and in this case visa basically agreed to uh well, well got the super bowls to go cashless and it was agreed in 2019 uh came out in 2020 and of course the narrative around it was that it was the pandemic that caused this but of course this deal was signed in 2019 this was always going to be the case all right and so many of these players weaponized the pandemic as part of the narrative around why everyone must go to was move move away. And I'm living in Germany right now. Big players like Lufthansa make project top down decisions to prevent people using cash. And I use this example because in Germany it's actually still a very pro cash society. There is no German citizen right now asking the Lufthansa executives to remove cash from from flights. This is a purely corporate optima profit optimization decision. It's got nothing to do with what people want. All right. Um, and of course, Visa and these players spend a lot of time trying to incentivize the small and medium sized businesses, especially the ones in the upper middle class, your kind of your bougie uh, parts of society. They try to create this whole aesthetic, this idea that what progress means is to reject cash and to move to um, Apple Pay, et cetera, and these types of card systems. So there's a lot of these cultural efforts to demonize the cash system and also structural efforts to break down access to the system. All right. So in my, uh, what, I guess, well, I'll close with this. What I've been doing a lot is to try and reframe this away from this idea of this, this horse cart narrative is to say, in reality, for many, many people, the cash is far more like the bicycle system of payments. All right. And it's important for maintaining a balance of power between those different types of money with different issuers in our society. All right. Um, so maintaining a resilience, inclusive balance of power in the monetary system. So what I'm arguing, I'm not arguing that everybody's got to use cash all the time. I'm got arguing that we maintain a balance of power. All right. Which is why this transport metaphor is very good because we all intuitively know we don't want a single form of transport to dominate an entire society if you want a resilient transport system. All right. So what I've been doing is replacing that horse cart metaphor with essentially a bicycle metaphor and also changing this car metaphor with another one, which is Uber. All right. Owning your own car is very different to being dependent upon Uber. All right. You might superficially perceive Uber to be convenient, but imagine if I was to ask you, do you want Uber to control all forms of transport in your society? Do you want your only way to, to move around to be uh, essentially via this app and a third party asking a third party to allow you to move around? And of course, the answer will be no. Everybody knows if Uber was to control the entire transport system, you'd have huge problems of centralization of power. You would have huge problems of uh, data extraction, surveillance, forms of censorship, but also just huge resilience problems. All right. And essentially an attack on forms of localized autonomy. All right. Which is why we maintain a balance of power in our transport system. And it should be very similar for our monetary system. All right. Um, when you become totally dependent upon the digital systems, you have huge problems of surveillance. You have huge problems of potential economic censorship. You have huge just plain resilience problems and the systems goes down. Um, you have massive exclusion problems in the sense of people who can't get access or who don't want to get access being um, essentially being firewalled out of the economy um, and then you have massive uh, problems of centralization of power in your economy it's essentially an attack on localization all right um, and the cash system is one of the few things that maintains this balance of power which is why it needs to be protected um, and that's basically my my main argument of course there's a lot of sort of, sort of sub arguments within that um, and specific arguments and of course there's a whole new realm right now with the crypto currency world imagining itself as being the sort of almost kind of digital alternative to the sort of mainstream digital world 
Um, but what I'm often seeing in the crypto world is, is actually out, often acting as a distraction from the important real world, um, the important um, uh, task of protecting the cash system. We shouldn't be focusing on sort of crypto fantasies. We should be focusing on the actual existing monetary system as it currently stands. Um, so that's basically it. Wonderful. Well, uh, a nice clear exposition there. Thank you very much. And, and actually you've generated a huge number of questions and comments. Uh, Trevor Hilder was off quickly. Uh, he's, uh, he's wants to be first in the queue to buy you a pint. Um, and he also uh, pointed out a very interesting situation of artists, which I put into the chat room for everyone, which you can read there. Um, uh, re really a, a, an intriguing example of uh, artists going out and buying 1.2 million of debt for 20,000 pounds and then blowing it up at Canary Wharf. Uh, oh yeah, it's a bank job. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know that. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, Trevor does say he, he is quite uh, quite fond of paying with his Apple Watch, uh, but he has a, a quick question, perhaps for you. Uh, Visa and Mastercard have net profits of about 50 percent, so this is hardly a free market, is it? Oh, then they're a massive oligopoly. Yeah. I mean, one thing will definitely will happen, of course, is that if this actual cashless situation is achieved, then we'll certainly start seeing a bunch of articles and stuff about the need to break the monopoly or sort of have some kind of antitrust. Um, but they, they have a huge monopoly. And of course, there's massive geopolitical elements to this too, which is, you know, the fact that countries like China don't want to essentially be subject to two American corporations controlling their payment system, uh, which is why there's all these attempts to build these parallel systems from um, countries like China. Uh, Richard Sage says, you know, Sweden is reported to be the furthest down the route of being cashless. You know, how are the institutions there uh, working? Are they preventing the disappearance of cash? Any, any comments on, on that situation? Well, interestingly, Sweden uh, issued a, um, a couple of years ago, they put out this, uh, a kind of like a, a emergency preparedness type of announcement for their citizens, suggesting that their citizens hold cash in the case of for example, uh, geopolitical conflict with Russia. All right. So many of these places like Sweden, the sort of idea that it's naturally better to have this, these fully automated, fully kind of digitized systems, uh, it kind of works if you have high levels of trust in your society and you, everyone's kind of on board with it. But as soon as there's some kind of breakdown in the resilience, whether that be through you know, natural disasters, whether it be through some kind of conflict, of course, you suddenly have a massive problem. And if you're a policymaker in Sweden, you're, sorry, you're being forced to think about this, All right? So there, in countries like Sweden and Netherlands, a lot of the central bankers are actually starting to get concerned. They're saying, oh, you know, damn, we've allowed this to happen. We've essentially allowed the private banking sector to take over the payment system, and this poses huge problems. Um, so yeah, they're um, kind of like stuck in the situation of how do they potentially backtrack? Okay. Um, Nikki Holtzhaus uh, is, uh, appreciates your contrarian view, uh, and she, she'd like to ask uh, the question, is the use of cash in the context of global trade or, or even trade within a country, but where individuals aren't located nearby to exchange cash? How, how do you, Brett, visualize the use of cash in these contexts? Well, I mean, this is where, you know, my bicycle metaphor is quite useful as well. I mean, I don't use my bicycle to try and travel to the US, right? Um, I would use a different form of transportation to get there. And so similarly, you know, in the realm of face-to-face um, -face commerce, that's traditionally the strong point, the stronghold of cash, right? This is why it's very much associated with small scale localism. If you think about how cash works, it's issued out by a big central issuer, but then once it's out in the hands of people, it can actually percolate from hand to hand. Um, and so why the imagery of cash very much evokes this idea of the sort of the more small scale interaction. Whereas of course, digital is about how do you project yourself at large distance, right? That's what the whole internet's about, right? So of course, digital payments totally dominates in the realm of digital commerce, right? Which is why players like Amazon hate the cash system, right? Because for example, when Amazon's putting out its uh, cashierless stores in places like in the US, and suddenly it has to try and accept cash, it just doesn't jar with all its attempts at large scale automation, right? Because cash is essentially about small scale human interaction. It's not about corporate automation, all right? Mm. So any large scale systems basically move towards the digital. Um, 
So yeah, you know, you don't find cash being used at a distance, but this is precisely the point. And actually, if you're looking at current resistance to cashless societies, often coming from people who are from these more, you know, who haven't yet been fully indoctrinated into a kind of like digital modernism, right? This idea that, oh, it's naturally better to constantly be tethered into Amazon all the time, right? There's many people in the world who actually find that idea repugnant, right? Um, and a lot of the sort of uh, pro-cash sentiment comes from people who feel that there's something wrong about being forced into these sort of distant interactions rather than closer interactions. I, I didn't put that in the clearest way. Um, but again, the point is not to say that you should be using cash for everything. The point is about the different um, strengths and weaknesses of the different systems and how you balance them off against each other. Okay. Um, Terry Downing has made a, a huge number of comments. I probably won't get them all, all squeezed in, but you will get all of them, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, but he was pointing out that using credit and debit cards is really using digital cash, which is, is core to your point. Um, that you know, there, there's crime on digital as well. Uh, that cash is just another form of transaction mechanism. You know, behind plastic cards is real currency if it is debt. Um, Bitcoin, uh, you know, he points out, does not have the issues of monitoring. I'm not trying to agree with Terry on that one, given what, what we're seeing. But what he, I think what he'd really like you to ask, if you don't mind, is um, two points. One is, can you compare the cost of dealing with cash and digital, which is one of the arguments that's made, uh, that it's the cost of it that uh, means we want to be digital. And uh, do you, how, how far do you see cash as the business continuity mechanism? in the case of digital cash failure. So this cost of cash argument is weaponized by anti-cash proponents all the time, right? So this idea that, oh, it's a higher cost for the fixed infrastructure of cash, et cetera. Um, one of the immediate points I, I will, this is maybe a bit of a trite point, but you know, my um, high quality jeans cost more than my cheap polyester shirt. But that doesn't mean that there's somehow something wrong with this idea. The reason why my jeans cost more is that they're better. All right. So many, many of our systems in society, especially ones we use for um, maintaining kind of balances of power, have costs. This is true. All right. The mere fact that something has a cost doesn't mean that somehow that makes it bad. All right. Um, and in fact, if you look at a monetary system, which holds an entire capitalist system together, without a monetary system, you have no capitalist system, no market system at all. If you're looking at something as structurally important as a monetary system, sort of pedantically, you know, mapping out the costs of the different types is not the point. You should be mapping the resilience of the system. All right. And often the sort of cost of cash argument is, is sort of a very shallow way of saying, okay, notionally, the digital systems can be cheaper. All right, but, um, but you have to look about what, what are you getting in the process for this cheaper good? All right, well, you're getting mass surveillance, for example. You're getting huge resilience problems. You're getting massive concentration of power in a, in a particular industry, which has huge political consequences. You have massive exclusion problems. These are the costs of, of moving away from, from the cash system. All right, so you've got to be balancing off those costs against the sort of notional uh, infrastructure costs, which to me, I, I think it's a, a no-brainer that you keep both of those systems going. All right. In terms of the, um, uh, uh, with this, with the second question about a kind of um, the, well, the contingency plans, was that? Yes, it was the contingency element behind it. You know, how, how far is, do you see cash as a contingency? Actually, while you're thinking about that, we're just going to run the poll quickly, um, just to get a flavor of how the audience is feeling, uh, giving, giving you a sort of 30 second break. So folks, uh, Given what we've heard, uh, would you like to have the option to use cash removed? Um, Brett, one of the great things about the audience is over half of them have voted. They're uh, a very, very uh, quick, quick audience uh, and, and quick computer <laughs> thinkers. Um, so we've got most of the audience has voted. We're just going to show the results of that poll. Uh, no. So I think, I think you're, <laughs> you're definitely preaching to an audience there. Uh, those 3% who said uh, actually they would like to have the option removed, uh, if you want to type something into the chat room uh, as to why you said that, I, I'd love to hear it. Um, well, Joe, well, Pinder, why, does, Joe Pinder why, points out that the question was a bit biased, but uh, we well, spoke about that. Why I like that question, Michael, is that, is that it's, it very quickly cuts through a lot of the a lot of the sort of messaging you hear from about cash society that, oh, people want this. If you ask people what they want, people like, people enjoy options. 
you know, even if they're not going to use the option, they still want the option. Nobody goes up to a shop owner and says, please, will you shut down your cash facilities? Yeah. All right. It's basically an industry move to do that. It's not what people demand. Yeah. All right. And this is why I asked this question, because if you say to somebody, do you want digital payment? They'll say yes. If you say, do you want cash removed? They'll say no. All right. It's a very yeah. simple, very simple um, point in a way. But in terms of this, um, going back to even business owners, I was at, um, I went to a music festival uh, this year in the UK, a secret garden party. I was uh, speaking there. And one of the amazing things is that they, they, they were quote unquote cashless at, at the festival. And of course they had all these people in a field who were trying to use the, the, their phone reception. And it caused the entire um, uh, phone data infrastructure to collapse. And basically all the, all the vendors couldn't take payments. So there were hundreds of people trying to get beer from the beer tent and the, the beer tent was just turning them away saying, we can't accept your payments. All right. Yeah. And all the staff were tearing their hair out. They're saying, if only we just took cash. And, and, the, and the vendors who are the sort of private vendors who did have cash facilities were raking it in big time. Right. So uh, yeah. this was a, a very good example, a very simple example of, of, the, of the kind of contingency and resilience aspect of this. But they, I mean, I see these examples every single day. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, the short-term convenience versus the long-term resilience trade-off. Well, um, one of the things I, I think is funny is uh, I've been at I've been at events like that where the, where the cash has been a problem, and I, and I won't say who because I appreciate the honesty. Somebody says I pressed the wrong button before reading the full question. My apologies. I do want the cash option, uh, <laughs> so, so the percentages go back up to a hundred there. I think. Um, so that that's excellent. Uh, just to return quickly, if we could, because we've got a lot of other questions here, but very short. Uh, Terry Downing did uh, have that second question about, uh, the, you know, the cost of managing the cash economy is expensive compared to digital, right? But how much how much good is it as a contingency for digital failure? Yeah, well, that's well, that's that's the point, right? And and bear in mind, it's, it, I mean, that, that that point about the Secret Garden Party was an example of. Yeah. of that in action but in terms of for for policymakers yeah this is huge i mean in the, in the in the us um to give you a slightly different different context i mean the federal reserve sees massive increases in cash demand prior to hurricane landings all right people want offline money when there is infrastructure um, um uh, threats but also prior to the as the pandemic was taking up a huge demand in the spike for the uh, uh, spike in demand for cash because people who when they're concerned about banking failure, yeah. essentially want their money in a, in a non-bank form, right? They don't want digital bank casino chips. They want the actual state money. So there's a bunch of the stuff around the resilience of the systems. And one of the reasons why the CBDC debate is happening right now is not really because of cryptocurrency. It's because a lot of the, the central bankers realize that there's no access to a public form of money. You have huge potential um, resilience problems, but also financial stability problems that, that emerge. Yeah. Uh, well, we've got a few comments here. You know, Gordon de la Mer, I, I like to use cash because I really don't want third parties tracking everything I buy, either for marketing or other nefarious purposes. Um, there's a lovely um, a metaphor I, I just have to share from uh, Diana Affelbacher. Uh, she's saying, automation began in the US with a hamburger. How is this a similar metaphor to cash and a progression, both negative and positive? So maybe for a future presentation, you can you can compare uh, all of this to McDonald's. Um, uh, but then I've got a, an interesting uh, bit here, really, uh, from Sue Ackers. Uh, she says it's hard to pay in, too, both personally and for charities. Uh, you know, and I, I've seen that on the streets as, as people are shaking the buckets. There's nothing in my pockets to put in the bucket. But what can we as individuals do, Sue wants to know? I'm on the boards of several small local charities, and we rely on being able to take cash payments and donations. As an individual, I like to use cash too. So yeah, any thoughts there? What, what can an individual do to, to stop this tide if that's what they want? Yeah, so this is a big thing, I guess. Uh, I'm not the only person who's concerned about this. There are many activists and community organizers and different people in the UK who have seen this to become becoming a really big problem. Um, there's different aspects of it. So um, there are a bunch of policy types of things that can be done, which are more sort of state driven should we say and when it comes to how the cashless loops work there's basically around access to cash acceptance of cash and then the branch network so basically um as atms are shut down 
it obviously reduces access to cash, uh, which then also, in relative terms, makes it seem more inconvenient. All right, so that's one aspect. But then as the acceptance of cash goes down, even if you can access cash, it's hard to use it with shops, all right? So there's a big acceptance part, uh, which is why there's sort of policy proposals to uh, ensure acceptance. But then there's the stuff around the branch network. The problem for like a lot of these small business owners is that they they realize the banks shut down the branches, which means they, they have to drive really far to deposit cash, all right? So there's these breakdowns in the cash distribution network or the cash cycle, which all have different approaches you can use to, to um, address them. But what actually also needs to happen in addition to this, these, these types of addressing those questions is to build a cultural movement, right? Because right now, if you're in London, especially if you're a part of the middle class uh, UK society, upper middle class, you basically feel ashamed to take cash out now, all right? I've seen that cultural change happen. You'll see people who literally have been shamed into thinking they're out of sync with the society if they don't use their Monzo card or they don't use their kind of digital thing, right? And that's because right now the cultural field is still dominated by the digital payments industry. So this yep. whole thing around the, the cash being the bicycle of payments essentially is around a kind of building a cultural movement to say, actually, it's acceptable and non-shameful for me to have this option, all right? Much like it, it took a while to build this idea that, you know, cycling was uh, positive. So I think actually there needs to be a bunch of movements building out this cultural message to say this is actually a totally legitimate political demand. Let me let me give a few comments here. A lot of, uh, frankly, I think potentially very helpful comments for you. Uh, Joe Pinder uh, points out that as a parent, the way we teach uh, children mo about money is using physical tokens. Uh, this helps with their understanding of relative costs, you know, more physical tokens for X, Y. Uh, you know, the future of monetary education in a Catholic society could be much more difficult, especially when children don't have a developed understanding of abstract numbers. So there's another argument for you. Uh, uh, Charlotte Dauber actually is, uh, actually, sorry, is, is, is push, pushing forward the legal tender argument. People should have a right to use cash. What about people with no access to bank accounts, uh, Visa, MasterCard, homeless, exclusion? So I, I think you've, you've, you've kind of made that point, but it's, it's definitely one there. Um, yeah. There's an interesting one from Chris Williams, fair enough to have cash as a low-level transaction format. So how about withdrawing all notes, say, above £10 or $10, so the, the large-scale criminal activity is effectively blocked, but you're still keeping the, the cash in the economy. Um, so uh, some really bits. A funny comment here from uh, Richard Sage, the Korean cover has a broken British coin. Does that indicate Koreans look to Britain rather than the USA for leadership on finance? or? <laughs> or on broken economies, I, I, I could add to that. Um, yeah, but uh, Richard, is a, we'll, we'll move off some of those, but just uh, moving on to a question from Richard. Visa and MasterCard do indeed have only small localized competition, which is dangerous. Auditing has had a problem for 20 years of only four large providers, which has generated various ideas about how to create more competitors. How might governments encourage more competition at the level of Visa and MasterCard? I don't have a strong answer on that, to be honest. I mean, the thing the thing with these is they're, they're network monopolies, right? Well, they're, they're network oligopolies. They they naturally kind of tend towards concentration, all right? So in some ways, this is the, um, you know, there's a certain degree of, um, for a person who doesn't want to face the reality that we need to protect the cash system, the immediate thing, thing the, the, the place your mind goes, a, per, a person's mind goes, is like, okay, well, let's create a bunch of diversity amongst the digital players, right? Mm -hmm. Create competition amongst the digital players. But there is there is tendencies within digital systems, which basically mean they get more useful the more people who use them, right? This is the your yeah. network effect concept. So yeah, I mean, governments can try to force forms of, you know, break them up and stuff, but that's, that's always gonna be a, a struggle. It's the same kind of struggle you have when you're trying to break up Amazon, for example. Yeah. Well, I'm a little surprised, actually, Brett, that it's taken so long for this to pop up because it was going to be my closing question. But Paul Finch, you know, a number of people are citing the drive by governments to create central bank digital currencies. Um, you know, is that real? And, and would this not, in fact, break up the monopoly of Visa and MasterCard? Uh, I mean, not necessarily, but I mean, I mean, Visa and MasterCard might be, you know, players in that. Um, I mean, bear in mind, Visa and MasterCard basically specialize in telling banks who's trying to move chips from who, whom to whom, so that they could probably get involved in forms of intermediation with the CBDC as well. Um, 
But yeah, the CBDC debate is, I mean, it's a complex one. Uh, but the, the way that I see it, I mean, I, I mean, one thing to immediately bear in mind is like, there's a lot of on the ground angst about CBDC, especially from people who've been moving towards the political right. All right. So amongst your kind of people who believe that the, the government is out there to sort of build a gigantic surveillance infrastructure and so on. Right. And what I've noticed is that actually many of the politicians lag in this in this argument around digital payments actually the digital payments agenda has been pushed largely by the big corporates i mean amazon these players this these are the true powers in an economy right these transnational digital players are the ones that have sort of created the ideology of endless digitization often politicians are just going along with that they often believe that to appear modern and to appear up to date and to keep the market infrastructure going they have to do this as well right so there's one element of, of that in the cbdc uh debate which a lot of these politicians are like oh you know damn we've got to do this now as well but of course there's a bunch of angst because if they issue these cbdc's they're potentially going to be competing with the digital casino chips of the banking sector and in a yeah. capitalist countries they don't necessarily want to do that because for example the bank of england isn't that interested in competing with santander and barclays and hsbc no. all right so yeah, there's I'm, a lot of like i'm, I'm not 100 percent sure I, I i follow that argument in the sense that before these organizations existed the banks were pushing it through uh, in in this country apax the association, association of payment and clearing services has been moving towards uh, pushing uh, towards a cashless economy for 30 years or more. So, but but let's leave that for a second. Um, uh, got a question here, really, from um, uh, from Hugh Purser. Uh, he, he was wondering about crypto's original aim was, was to break this, and that hasn't quite worked. But do gold or other assets have a role? Uh, and just quickly, because we've only got a few more minutes. Sure. Um, I mean, I have no comments about gold or other assets, but let me talk about crypto because it's actually quite an important part of this. The Bitcoin world did frame itself as being, at least initially, um, as being a kind of digital cash, which could act against this um, corporate slash state kind of complex of the sort of mainstream digital payments. Um, and what's happened with the Bitcoin world is it's, it's largely become a... Uh, I guess a digital collectible priced in monetary in money that could be bought and sold for money. Um, but one of the interesting properties which I write a lot about with with Bitcoin is it's used for counter trade. Um, counter trade is basically the process where you use a non monetary object for exchange via yeah. its monetary price. All right. And so all Bitcoin quote unquote purchases when somebody's using Bitcoin to buy something, they're essentially using its US dollar resale price to buy things. All right, they're not actually using Bitcoin to buy, they're using its implicit resale price to, to get stuff, right? Which is why they constantly have to reference themselves to the, to the speculative market price, but before they know what the exchange ratio is. So I write about counter trade a lot, but what's interesting is actually this counter trade is becoming potentially a lot more prominent in the global uh, economy going forward, all right? So in the Bitcoin world, they imagine that they're competing with the US dollar and so on, but really what they're doing is they ride on top of the dollar system and have the sort of counter trade system, which could actually become interesting in future in terms of a sort of yeah. marginal okay. yeah. alternative. Okay. Counter trade is actually quite huge. The OECD estimates are 25 to 40 percent of global trade is, uh, in fact, uh, yeah, um, corporate into corporate counter trade, sure. But in terms of like retail counter trade, it's, it's, it's not. We're really going to have to be short. Uh, so, very quickly, uh, Nadine Rose, uh, Brett, how do you see the balance of power when it comes to M PESA in Kenya? This is meant to have created security and equality for a lot of smallholder farmers and producers to access payments. Yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert on the Mpesa system, but again, the Mpesa system is like a is very is very uh, linked to the cash system in Kenya. Actually, it's not necessarily a cash killer. Often, actually, people who are receiving Mpesa often uh, redeem it back for cash, or there's a there's an interaction between the cash system and the Mpesa system, right? Mm -hmm. Which is um, actually, what you would expect in lots of informal economies that actually the cash system is often perceived as the de facto underlying standard, and then you have these digital systems that interact. Okay, and our final question, which I think will be music to your ears, uh, from Bruce Milligan. In your experience, what are some good, what, what is a good quick strategy, you know, a conversation starter to wake people up to thinking about the importance of preserving cash? Um, I'm going to just basically cheat and say, um, 
uh, those two metaphors I, I use are actually quite interesting things for people to debate. This idea mm -hmm. of the digital casino chip. Um, you know, do you realize that that's what digital money is? A lot of people don't realize that, especially if they're not from the kind of like, you know, uh, your intelligentsia circles. Um, and then this idea around the bicycle of payments. Well, this idea of, and it's quite interesting when you, when you ask people things like, you know, hey, you know, you might like the elevator in a, in a, in a skyscraper, but do you want the emergency stairs to be taken out? Yeah. Right. These kind of things are quite an interesting way to sort of frame this, especially for people who are very pro digital, because you're basically saying, I'm not attacking your pro digital position. I'm asking for balance. Right. And that's, that's often the way to do it for me. Well, I think uh, sadly we've really run out of time and a little bit over, but I, I do like this a lot. I think you've, you've, Get definitely given the audience uh, your question. I would like to have the option to use cash removed from me as I think a good uh, conversation starter. And then of course yeah. you've got your metaphor of uh, the horse cart and uh, sorry, the, the pounds in the bank account or casino chips and then the, the uh, second metaphor on the public bicycle. So I think those are both good things to take away along with that question. So uh, really, really good stuff. And I think the best closing comment might, might come actually from Terry Downing. You know, who do you trust more? a government-run transaction network or a market-driven, regulated, commercial secure network world available across the goal. And uh, that's, I think, the future as we look to CBDC versus uh, this sort of corporate uh, option. So a lot, a lot to think about. We had no time to talk about some of other areas people like to dive down uh, on uh, uh, Hugh Purser on counterfeits and uh, forgery. Uh, Nikki Holzhauser would really love to chat more about your views on uh, how does currency obtain its value. But no time for that, uh, but I do have time for three quick thank yous, if I may. Firstly, as ever, to our sponsors. Without you, we couldn't be doing all this, so thank you. I, I hope you found it fascinating. Secondly, I'd like to thank the audience. An extremely vibrant session today, and, and Brett will be getting all those comments. Um, but lastly, if I may, Brett, I need to thank you. Uh, without you, this wouldn't have happened. Uh, your book's out there, and folks as well. Uh, it's a very vibrant blog. Well, it's starting to be vibrant again. You had a bit of a break uh, for a while. Um, but uh, back in action. And I'm going to use some very, very analog technology, nothing digital, to give you some applause. So here's our little Korean karmic clapper. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, and the audience out here is uh, putting in a whole bunch of nice comments about how, how good this has been. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back and see how the argument develops over the years. So yeah, thanks, thanks very so much. much. I really, really appreciate it, Michael. Thanks.